Thank you very much for inviting me here to this uh, wonderful event. I'm a Brit, so I've still got my glottal stop. And uh, the first slide is an area that's about only slide of your local area. Because one of the things I'm going to try and do, what I try to do throughout my research on area, is to bring a more global view in comparing what other people are doing in other parts of the world, um, and to bring a, a, a more scientific perspective to what's happening locally here in DC. So I put here as my first slide in, in a moment um, the silver garland. Can you please and get yes. a little closer to the mic? Just okay. lift the mic from the bit. Yeah. Testing you can move close to the mic. Yeah, exactly. So I put silver darlings in this first slide, and the silver darlings is a Scottish word for you know, just the Scottish uh, Scottish word for uh, herring, and it goes back centuries. It goes back to the 1600s actually. Um, and there's a wonderful novel which was written in the 1940s, but is still in print, it's very popular. It's kind of soap opera, following the fortunes of a Scottish crofting family who adopt the new drift net fishery for the herring in the late 1700s. And um, the novel follows through what happened in the next 40 years. In the next 40 years, the inshore herring in Scotland were completely depleted by this very valuable and profitable uh, fishery. The, the poor crofting family becomes quite rich and they build a mansion and all this stuff. And the novel ends with the fishermen from this one village, including the crofting family, having to go further and further round to the North Cape of Scotland with the very high energy Atlantic waters with big storms. And the, the ladies of the, of the ladies and children of the village would, would wait for their husbands and brothers and uncles to come back from a fishing trip, they wait on the cliff. And at the end of the novel, they wait on the cliff, and no one comes back, because they all drowned in a huge storm. The social consequence of overfishing herring. And if you want to read the novel, it is really good, good reading. So there's the silver darlings, and here you have silver darlings, and that word is a more, comes from somewhere else. So I tried to talk more about herring aid. Um, sorry about the pun. But the original title was, Can New Ecosystem-Based Science Save the Herring? So that's what I'm going to talk about. And a lot of people have helped with what you're going to see, some of the work that you've seen. There's a whole stack of them here from the research group, which is very well in, in the UBC and other people's groups. And you're going to hear later from Dr. Mimi Lam, who's uh, waiting to talk after them. But there's a Russian gentleman, and Kenny Hakimov, who's an oceanographer, Wayne Smith, who's an American who works, which you'll see later, and uh, Vivaki and Rajiv Kumar from India, Simon Sober and Jeff Scott from, uh, oh, Jeff Scott's actually American. Simon Sober. Closer Sober, to the mic, please. Canadian. Can't hear you. So still, I can hear you really well, that's the problem. You need a Harrogate. <laughs> that's what the talk's providing, we're trying to. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, herring aid at Hornby, what's going to be, what, are, what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk very briefly, like uh, uh, Don, um, not Don later, and uh, Grant earlier. I'm going to give you a brief history, a rather different history, of the BC herring um, fishery. And then I have three questions. Does fishing herring affect the rest of the ecosystem? What impacts could climate change have on our herring population? And I'll show you some evidence about what that is. And the third question is not something I've worked on directly myself, but relates to work of others in the group. And the question is, do herring go home to spawn? So those are three, three issues I'm going to look at, and hopefully provide some information about them. History of the BC herring fishery. This is a new plot that nobody, nobody um, Actually, only one group has seen it so far. Um, it takes some old material from Max Stocker, that was in the DFO, from the early part of the fishery, and then some new data from the 1950s on, which has just been published by a colleague's work in a project called the Sea Around Us Project, uh, which looks at global, globally uh, what the fish catches have been for every country in the world, including Pacific Canada. And what they did was to obtain data uh, from largely, largely the Russian fleet, which was, but also the Cuban fleet and one or two other Soviet fleets, 
They were fishing around the world in the 1950s and 60s before countries declare their tourism nautical mile exclusive zones. And they got really good daily data, but it was all secret. I mean, nobody knew what it was until various people managed to obtain it. And that has a stunning look of, okay, nowadays, all of the herring fisheries are within our 200 nautical mile zone. But of course, in the 50s and 60s, I think we only had a 12, 12 nautical mile um, territorial waters. And outside the 12 miles, anybody could come and fish. And they did. In fact, sometimes they came even inside the 12 miles. Uh, and people were a bit suspicious when they saw this data. But I've actually talked to three people now of the older generation, including a fisherman in Steveston. And a DFO person who's not that far away from you guys. <laughs> Maybe it could be. <clears throat> Don't care. But um, they remember seeing the Russians here quite close in shore. And so the fact that they were catching herring is not surprising, actually. So what I have in the, the early part is the beginning of the fishery, the earliest recorded fishery, I think, is around about 18, um, 1888, I think it was, where a whole stack of herring were caught in Burrard Inlet in Vancouver. And they got so many of them, they didn't know what to do. They ate a few, but they got so many of them that they spread them on the fields as fertilizer. It's awful. Um, and that fertilizer period went through to the turn of the century, to about 1900. And then there was a dry salted product that came in, uh, and that soon turned into uh, locally available fresh herring and smoked herring as kippers, which used to be available in Vancouver for people, especially people of European immigration. And that goes up until the, uh, through the Second World War with the deep decrease in catches. Then by 1950, we're seeing the foreign fleets come in and also considerable, and this is the other part of the data that's recently become available as estimates, considerable unreported and illegal catch by, by Canadians. And so the, the total catches that we see here in the 50s and 60s go up to a peak of almost half a million tons of herring, 500,000 tons of herring. That figure is more than twice what the official data that you see from our government records, which is about, to, it's about a quarter of a million. But actually, the real catches were about half a million. So it's not surprising that there was a huge collapse. And the fishery was closed um, for, from 1968 for about four or five years, I think, different places, different years. Um, and then was replaced by the new fishery. Up until that point, most of the fish, there was some for local consumption, but most of the fish um, was actually um, dried in a fish meal reduction plant and used for fertilizer and, and fish feed and, and uh, pig feed and chicken feed and that kind of thing. So that's this reduction fishery. It actually started in the 1930s in a small way, but became very large. That, after the closure, it was, that, co that closure coincided by random factors with the collapse of a large, what had formerly been a very large fishery for herring in Japan. And that, the Japanese, traditional Japanese, liked eating spawn on kelp, they liked eating and they liked eating the eggs. But their supply for the eggs to eat dried up because of the collapse of that Hokkaido herring in northern, in, in, in northern Japan. At the same time, people here were, who were in ton contact with the Japanese realized that we might be able to supply eggs from here. And so the row fishery, which we see today, began in the early 1970s. It's the row fishery. There's also been a market for, in Japan and some other Asian countries, for the eggs stuck on the kelp, which was of course, a traditional First Nations product. Um, so Grant showed us that, uh, that stuff earlier. The whole point about this fishery from a global perspective is that it's a spag fish. What do you mean by spag? Spag means a, spawning a fishery on a spawning aggregation. And there are whole international committees run by uh, United Nations to with great concern about spag fisheries. And most of the ones they're concerned with are in the tropics, um, therefore for groupers and snappers and so on. 
and there's a lot, a, a great pressure to control spag fisheries. And then, <laughs> but here in Canada, we actually have a spag fishery. This is a fishery on a spawning aggregation of fish. They're terribly vulnerable. You've got to be really careful because you can totally over-exploit them and also wipe out a whole generation of eggs that are going to hatch into baby fish and um, larvae. That, that, the picture that you were looking at was a larva, <laughs> and the, which turned into juveniles and then turned into big hair, hopefully. So we have a spag fisher again. So we've got to be really precautionary about the way that we um, we're precautionary about the way that we treat these uh, treat these fish. The, the fishery that we've been working on mostly in our project has been the hybrid wild herring fishery, which is uh, in a bad way. Um, it, the fishery has been closed for about ten years, and this is the, just the DFO stock assessment plot of of the uh, biomass of herring uh, back to the 1950s starting point for most of the data, and you can see it it comes down. Uh, it's there's a small recovery recently, but it's never really uh, got to the point where the fishery would be open. Uh, although, mm, the minister has tried to open it recently, and we'll hear more about that in the Lounge talk, which will be after the wonderful lunch that we're all waiting for. I have a lot of criticisms of the DFO stock assessment process. Um, I've summarised them here, but um, I'm not really going to go into that, that amount of detail, because to, to, to get it, you, you'll need to know more about standard stock assessment. But what I will say is that the stock assessment is supposed to take account of the whole life history of the herring, from the egg, through the larva, through juveniles, to the adults that spawn, the whole life history. Um, and there's only one point in that life history where they have any serious validation of the actual numbers. And that is where they calculate the number of spawning, similar techniques used for sardines and anchovies around the world, and it is known to be seriously uncertain. There are big, big confidence limits on every figure that you use in that, um, and uh, that is a really weak point. Other places, also in Alaska, for example, also use this technique, but they at least go out and survey the number of adult pairing using uh, acoustics. Survey acoustics, and also some in some places net samples. So here we only have the, they don't do the acoustics anymore. So here we only have that one validation figure in the whole of the stock assessment series. The other big problem with this stock assessment for me is that it's only concerned with mathematical models of the herring themselves. How many herring babies are there? How many herring females are there? how many herring eggs will you expect? And it's just a herring. So they do not take account of either the planktonic organisms that the herring eat in order to carry on going, their food, they do not take account of the 20 or more other members of the ecosystem that eat herring. And so that's what we've tried to do. We've tried to bring the ecosystem perspective into the way that we look at what herring might do. So I summarised here, does fishing herring affect the rest of the ecosystem? It's the first of my three questions. And yes, the single species assessment that's used today ignores the food of the herring and ignores those who eat herring. The ecosystem modelling that we do can try to make estimates for the impacts on herring eaters and um, you'll see how we've tried to do that. It also has its problems. That's what we, what we try to do to improve things. It also, most of the work, ignores the fact that herring have two ways of eating. They're quite good at filter feeding. That is, they can open their gill covers, this be open my gill covers, <laughs> open the gill covers, and swim with a sort of sculling motion of the tail, with their head slightly up, because it, putting the gill covers out destroys their hydrodynamic advantage, they're slightly out of balance. So they're swimming with their tail, can't do it actually. Swimming with their tail, holding the gill covers up, right? And, uh, so that you can see that if you go to Vancouver Aquarium, you can see a, a, a school of herring doing this. Um, and they open their mouths, and the little tiny plankton uh, is caught on the little bony gill rakers, the little bones that hold the, hold the gills out. And then every so often they'll close their mouth and close the gill covers and swallow. Um, and they're doing that. Anchovies do it even more than herring, so lots of small fish do it. Um, and herring can do it. 
Most anchovies have to do it, because it's the only way to know how to eat. And their whole body is designed to be able to do this all the time. But herring, they can have an option. They can, if they see something big and juicy, like a nice big krill or big shrimp, they can stop this, close the oil covers, and leap on the, 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 the prey out and, and swallow it. And they can do that because they've got lots of white muscle, lots of muscle that's only designed for acceleration. Most of the time they're cruising with, with uh, a muscle that's got a very good blood supply. When you, can, when you eat a herring, if you ever eat a herring, <laughs> you can see down the side of the herring, too, when you've cooked it, it's like dark. And that's the, 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 the cruising muscles that are designed to keep going all the time with a good blood supply. But the rest of the herring that you eat is white meat, and that's the, the, the emergency. And so when they see white well, sometimes it's much of an emergency, it's a, a desire to eat something quickly. So they, they leap on the plank and eat it. So they can eat particles, large particles, or they can eat small particles. And, and most of the work that's been done with herring kind of ignores the fact that this, this is actually been well documented in the 70s and when some of us started their careers. <laughs> You see that up here. Right. <clears throat> so two feeding methods is usually ignored. And, and the other thing you need for our, um, for our modeling is real stomach content diets, the herring stomachs from the region that you're trying to look at. And we've, because most of our modeling is on northern BC, we've taken great care to uh, take all of the information available from northern BC, but also do some new sampling for um, the diet of herring, what do they actually eat. Um, and we've used that quite extensively, actually, and it's very important. It turns out that what they eat is, um, varies a lot by location and time. So the model has to be very flexible in allowing the diet of the herring in the model to change according to what's available. And we, we do that. So we have a diet of the herring, we have their preferences for different locations, but actually in the model they use those preferences but they also moderate the preferences by what's actually available that day in the ocean. Um, and what's available that day in the ocean in our model is also driven by things that change by the day. So the model's a bit complicated. Um, it's a little bit like um, weather forecasting. That's lots of equations. And weather forecasting is a bit dodgy, right? But these days, eh, it's, it's, it's a lot better to have it than not have it, and sometimes it's wrong, okay? So that's what our ecosystem models are like, really. A bit like a weather forecast. We're comfortable with the weather forecast, but you can't always be absolutely precise. Um, it goes back a long way, this type of model, actually. It goes back to <coughs> Peter Bruegel, the elder, in the 1500s. I drew this picture, which shows um, that every big fish, eat, it's called, in Dutch, big fish, Big fish eat little fish, 1556. And basically that's our model. Um, all the things that each organism eats are in the model, and the organism eats them and in order to, to uh, survive and respire and grow and all that kind of, and reproduce. So that's right. I think this is, uh, this is me <laughs> catching a little one. And this is my colleague, who some of you have heard of, called Daniel Paul, who's very famous. Low, see how it is. And what it's like. uh, there's also a colleague up here with, uh, with a laptop in his hut. <laughs> it's a model called a mass balance dynamic existing model. And the people who invented it um, uh, there's uh, a gentleman from Hawaii, uh, one from Denmark, and uh, one from BC. What it is, is here's one group in this circle here. It uses what it eats to, uh, to respire, to, to get oxygen, uh, use oxygen for, to get energy. It uh, uses, sometimes it slobbers its food, so it's unassimilated food, like it, you know, it's eating so much that some falls out of its mouth, and that's quite common in fish. Um, and then some is eaten by predators, some is caught by the fishery. And then there's another category called other, which is supposed to cover disease and things like that, and parasites and that sort of thing. So each group in the system is represented by one of these spheres, and is the output, if you like, is partitioned amongst the different things that it has to do. And there can be a lot of them. 
the model that we've got in the, for the Haida Gwaii ecosystem system has got about 78 groups in it, which is a lot. And this is an academic slide showing you what the model looks like, which is probably the, the broidal picture is a lot better. <laughs> Anyway, so we've actually worked with two First Nations partners here with the, uh, from, the, from, the, uh, from the Haida and the Health Circle. And most of the information came from the Haida. We've got actually a thing called the HOT team, the Haida Oceans Technical Team, which is quite, quite a good group. And they've <coughs> provided a little local data for this one. Um, it's published in a report, which is nice. Uh, and the models each month, I think, week, month, week? Week or month? Um, depends which the model is. Either week or month. The model goes through time steps of a week or a month, and that's driven by the amount of uh, plant plankton, phytoplankton, that's in the water. And we have data for that for uh, many of the years. And what we do is we take a random selection of those years and run the thing forward to, to see what might happen if future years are like past years. And, that's a reasonable assumption. We can change that for climate change in the moment. So we've got 71, 78 groups and 21 fisheries, of which one, of which two are the herring. One's the gillnet and the other one's the same. Oh, sorry, sorry. We've got spawn on kelp, we've got three herring fisheries. We've got spawn on kelp, the gillnet, and the same. Um, who eats what? Here's a slide showing who eats what in the system. Um, this is who eats herring, and out of the 78 groups, 20 of our groups eat herring in the mob, and we hope that's like the real world, like the weather. You know? um, uh, this is a plot showing adult herring and juvenile herring with a pale blue, and this is the percentage of the diet in, um, oh no it's not, it's the absolute diet in tons per kilometer per square, per square uh, of the um, diet. So you can see the biggest consum consumer of adult herring isn't even on DFO's graph, um, which is why I complained about it when somebody asked me that. Um, and that's the porpoise, the Dallas porpoise and, and, and dolphins. Um, uh, so that's the biggest consumer, uh, followed by hake, uh, seals, sea lions, humpbacks are pretty big as well. Uh, and then that, most people forget the arrow tooth flounder, that's eating a lot of herring too. Um, and then the, oh, here's the rest of the 20 coming across the graph. Um, uh, Chinook salmon. Although they, they can eat a lot of herring, uh, in our data they, they, they're, quite, they're in the middle of the range of the predators and dogfish and seabirds eat, eat more. We haven't been able to split out the seabirds into the different species of seabirds which we would love to do, which all the bird people want us to do. But the problem with seabirds in this type of model is that the biomass, and it's a biomass model, the biomass is really small and you can actually run the model without seabirds to help. <laughs> People hate this, but <laughs> you can run the model without seabirds and it works perfectly well and doesn't change very much. So it's really critical for the seabirds, but the seabirds in our modeling world don't really have much impact on what, what happens. Whereas things like humpback whales and uh, octopuses and things do. I've got a prettier, sort of a prettier graph here, which is the whole the 78 groups in the model, <clears throat> arranged by the level in the system, the level in the food web. So this is a food web model. And the things that produce energy, the phytoplankton and, and plants are at the bottom, and things like orcas that eat, um, not marine mammals are right at the top. And those are the transient orcas that eat the, eat the sea lions and seals and so on. Um, and what this particular plot shows is the, 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 the size of the blobs is roughly proportional to the percentage of biomass in that organism. And um, all the things that eat krill, the little shrimpy things, and then the green lines show what the krill eats. And then I can do that for uh, another plankton organism. Yeah. So that was the krill. It's obviously pretty important to lots of people, lots of organisms in the model, and in the real world. And then this is the um, uh, copepods. I don't know. You know, some of this heard of them. Good. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it, but it's a little, it's not a shrimp, it's a little thing, a little antenna, and it's, it looks a bit like this. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> but it's very small. And it's really important. Okay, right, copepods are critical. And especially as copepods have a little oil, over, over the winter, they have a little globule of oil. And that means that when things wake up, 
after the winter and it gets a little bit warmer. The only thing that's out there that's quite juicy to eat are these cocoa ponds with their little oil in front of them. So actually herring um, go for these things preferentially before the spring bloom of plankton starts. So they're quite important to a lot of organisms in the system. And what about the herring? Oh, we've got herring in here as well. This is the um, food web of the adult herring, and you can see they eat quite a lot of, uh, quite a lot of plankton, <coughs> you voices and those copepod things, uh, and other stuff. Uh, they eat a few fish as well, small fish. And here's the 20 things that eat them in that food web. And we've got the middle-aged herring, which is quite similar, but eats, eats slightly fewer things. And we've got the babies as well, somewhere. Yeah, there's the babies. Okay, so there's the baby herring and their food web. And they, they, have, they, they actually prefer these uh, um, funny cocoa things. What can we do with it? We can do with a lot of things with this model because it's, uh, and it takes a long time to run. Uh, on a modern computer, it takes about 10 minutes to run 50 years, which is, those of you who use computers realize that really slow <laughs> because there's a lot of equations happening at the same time. Here's one of the simple questions we could ask. What about the recovery of our humpback whales? Um, we fitted some models to the recovery of the humpback whale since the whaling stopped in the 60s. And we have an idea that they're probably currently um, about 500 tons of them in the, in the, in the northern British Columbia, um, probably more down here. And we estimate that they're heading towards uh, stopping that increase. They'll reach their maximum capacity of about 750 to 1,000 tons, something like that. So they're probably two thirds of the way up there to full recovery. So if we catch herring, we can, we can the, the, the humpbacks are in the model, running away, um, feeding and stuff. Um, and we can have a herring fishery in the model, or we can switch the herring fishery off. If we switch the herring fishery off, the recovery um, takes about 15 years, sorry, so with no herring fishery, they recover in 36 years. If we take the present fishery, um, that extends to 50, just over 50 years. So the delay is about 15 years before they reach the full, uh, their full recovery, according to our estimates anyway. And is that worth it? Um, you know, conservation organizations like yourself might say yes, but you talk to the herring fishing industry and they'll say, nah, they'll come back anyway. So you've only, only got to wait another 50 years. You know, I've only got to wait another 15 years. Why don't we just do that? So, so there's a, actually a, a, a um, who said I'm not supposed to use the word policy? There's a policy choice, there's a political choice there, right? Between conservation groups like yourselves and the fishing industry. And in this particular case, you have got to wait 15 years longer. Is, is it worth it? What might happen in that 15 years? So to get to the fishing and fishery itself, um, you've got to know a little bit to, to, uh, about how it's operated. Um, to understand our modeling, because we've compared various various um, choices of how the fishery operates compared to other herring fisheries and uh, similar fisheries around the world, and, and some recommendations from some international uh, conservation groups. So this it's called a, a, a um, it's called a, a, a harvest control rule, which is putting a surprising agricultural spin on what's actually wild ca capture of wild animals but still really like the official term the harvest control rule harvesting the herring when you didn't plant them did you? Uh, okay. you you may have planted some of your you may have planted your your your, 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 your um, oysters on the beach but you didn't plant the herring um, okay so what you do is you don't open the fishery until there's a certain threshold amount of herring that are there. So if if you always have the fishery open, the threshold zero. So that's zero. That means that of, of four fish that were originally there before there was any fishing, um, none of them are back, but you go fishing anyway. Right? So that's the always open fishing policy. The other extreme is not to have any fishery, which is over here. And there you you all four fish that were originally there are there. But the actual policy that's used here is that is the 25% threshold. So you wait until one herring in four of those that were there originally is back, and then you open the fishery. If there's less than that there, then you don't fish. 
And that's the one that's currently used. The alternative thresholds that we look at, once the fishery is open, then you fish it at a standard rate of 20%, which is a kind of internationally accepted level. Um, people are used to formally use 40%, so reducing it by half to 20% is, is a reasonable thing to try and do. And, and here, um, DFO, if there's a worry as to whether the, the biomass has crossed the threshold or not, if you're not quite certain, then here DFO have been using, it's certainly in northern BC, uh, a fishing rate of 10%, which is, again, reasonably precautionary if you want to do this thing. So these rules are built into our model when we switch the herring fishery on, and it runs differently depending on the threshold that's chosen or the actual fishing rate that's chosen. And here's one example of run of the model. It's a lot of jiggly lines. <laughs> and this is the model, model run for a, a random set of 100, 100 past years are now run in the model um, with the phytoplankton driving the system and other things. Um, so it trundles up and down as it does in the real world. And what we've done here is to put the blue line on which is the 25% um, threshold for this particular run of the model. Um, so the original biomass must have been four times that would be <coughs> off the top of the off the top of the slide. Okay. So here it is running along. Um, and the different the, the green line is the average and the black lines are each individual year when some some of the parameters are chosen at random. So it's called a Monte Carlo simulation method. Monte Carlo because of the random the supposed randomness of the real world. And, and that's, that's one run. We, we'd actually do maybe a thousand runs like that um, and then ask ourselves questions <coughs> like, oh, <coughs> what, do okay. what do we do now? Now we try and show you some results. Um, what we've done here on these plots is to look at a part of that, I mean, a significant part of that ecosystem of 78 groups in the model. Um, we've looked at about 20, 25 of them because it's it's difficult to show all 78 all at once. You can, you know, your mind gets boggled. Um, it's not a good thing, having the mind boggled when you're doing a computer program. So the colour bars show for the selected group out of the system, the important selected group out of the system, which includes um, salmon, krill, sea lions, um, juvenile and adult herring, those porpoises, humpback whales, hake, seabirds, crabs and so on. Um, the colour represents the change to the average from those many, many, many runs of the model. Um, so blue means things increase, and uh, the reddish uh, colours um, mean a decrease. And you can see here that for the traditional spawn on kelp fishery, at least in my why, it has very little impact on the system. So that's a good result. It means the spawner, you can do quite a lot of the spawn, and as you careful about the exact positions that you take the spawn, and, and sometimes they have to go and collect kelp from somewhere else to, to set up the system, to set up the ponding system. Um, you can see the spawn on kelp, it, it, it's reasonable. And here's DFO's present policy with the 25% cutoff and the 20% um, fishing rate. Hmm. This was a surprise to us. It's not as bad as it could be for <laughs> It is fair enough that it's a re in terms of its impact on the ecosystem, DFO's present fishing policy is reasonably proportional. But well, um, this is when they choose a 10% rate. It's even better, okay? Well, as you'd expect. Here's the Lenfest recommendation. Um, it's better. So it's quite clear that with the standard constant world of this particular simulation, um, DFO's policy is precautionary, but you could do better by adopting the Lenfest criterion of the 50% cutoff. That's, that's two fish out of four have come back in the cover. So it would be better. Oh, if we were in Europe, um, we would have a government policy that says we should take maximum sustainable yield from the herring. So we calculated what that would be using the standard methods. And that's terrible. In terms of its impact on the rest of the system, the objective of MS1 is not precautionary in terms of the ecosystem. So it's a good job that we're in North America and not in Europe. In fact, much of the world, Australia, 
South, South Africa, um, much of Asia, tries to adopt a maximum sustainable view of policy. And I can show you that in straight away. Yeah. This one. So there's the original, um, just using the average from DFO from all of the kind of past years, we, we now run the model with the worst 25% of the years. Oh dear. That, these are huge changes um, to the biomass of all sorts of organisms in the system, including the herring themselves. So that's a real warning that this climate risk is a significant problem that we have to deal with because we know that it's happening. We know that it's going to going to get worse, the IPCC people, the climate change people run models not dissimilar to what we do. Um, and they say that there's a real risk there. So the problem with our fishing policy is not that it's precautionary on average, it's not precautionary in terms of hedging the risk against this climate change that's going to happen. So there could be significant changes in the ecosystem. Now let's switch, <coughs> switch gear for a moment. <coughs> This is a tale of two billionaires. This is Peter Wall, who founded a, an institute called the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies, without at the time knowing quite what that was, but he did, and he gave lots of money to UBC. And they've been wonderful because they actually will sponsor and fund small projects that have all sorts of, uh, of, of, of multidisciplinary using buzzword um, problems with them. And they've, they've funded it four or five, is it me? Four, five, four. Oh, okay, you had a hand, but I didn't, I didn't see the phone. <laughs> Four uh, of our projects, and, and uh, me will talk about several of those after lunch. He's a great guy. <clears throat> Here's another billionaire. <laughs> I, I do not give his name, but you know who he is. Um, and this is a plot run by Ecotrust showing that the ownership of the uh, licenses in the herring fishery, and this, this little blob in the middle, looks like an amoeba that's ingesting something, isn't it? Yeah. Um, is, is, is his. Um, I have to say that he does give 10% of his income to uh, the hospitals in that field. So he's a good guy in that respect. But I'm not sure about his impact on the fishery because um, <laughs> the problem is when, the, when you've got a single you know, dominant owner, um, it's quite easy for the government to contact this owner or the, this owner to contact the government. And, Worldwide, there's been an analysis of the capture of fisheries management by large corporations. I'll say no more about that. But. So some of our results lead into what's called a decision table, which is how the, the, those who make the decisions, and politicians and bureaucrats largely, um, how they make decisions about what's going to happen next. And here's the, the, the scenarios in our model with the different opening uh, levels from 0% to the present one of one fishing for up to no fishing at all, um, and the mortality rates which are made usually 20%. And so the colour of the different lines shows the, uh, the quality, if you like, of the information as to whether things would, would help the herring or not. So the sustainable herring biomass, the present policy is, well, it's not too bad, but because of the risk of climate, we've coloured it on the red side. If we always fish all the time, everything's terrible. Um, if we don't fish at all, then it's quite good, for the what you think, for herring biomass. So we've looked at the recovery of herring, humpback whale recovery, you saw the plot for that. Uh, the quality of the, the information on the marine impact on the marine food web, and then the climate, uh, there's two different climate uh, scenarios that we looked at as the shift. And you can see that um, only maybe the Lenfest precautionary one is a reasonable compromise for the um, having reasonably large <coughs> impacts on uh, that marine ecosystem. I've been told to hurry up, so. So I'll switch to the final topic, which I'll do very briefly. Um, third question Do herring go home to spawn? Okay. There's a paper in the academic literature in the 1990s, which was originally in French, so nobody read it except in Canada, I guess. Um, and it's called Obstinate Nature. And Philippe Curie, who's a senior, eminent scientist, points out in that paper, and analyzes the fact that this all, all animals, whether they're fish or eagles or whatever, have an evolutionary advantage if they go home to where they came from 
to reproduce. Uh, the reason, simple reason, is that they survive to reproduce. Right? So evolution will home in on that attribute of actually surviving. So that's true of all animals. It's actually even more true of most fish. I mean, see the rats go home. All sorts of fish go home. And what we see here is kind of bends the mind is because we've got the salmon that go home par excellence. They go back to the little creek that they came from. Ah, do they all go back? Well, actually, no. They don't all go back. Um, and the average strain, even in salmon, can be as high as 20%. If that did not happen, you would never get the colonization of the areas that have been wiped out, or they've been a volcano or something, or a tsunami. <laughs> so they, they do go back to where they want to go home, but many fish stray. They may be, that may be genetically determined. Now, the traditional technique of seeing whether they're, um, whether they're genetically the same, they've come from the same place, um, more than 8% strays swamp that technique and you get the answer, no, they didn't stray, they, 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 they did stray, there's no, no evidence that they all went home. But recently, in the last four or five years, um, the modern DNA sequencing, uh, high, throughput, high throughput sequencing techniques, uh, can distinguish populations that were as many as quarter of them stray. And this has been used on herring in Europe. Uh, North Sea herring, for example, now is managed on the basis of small stocklets, which go home, or at least 75% of them go home, um, to the areas that were actually first distinguished by herring fishermen in the North Sea in the 1880s, which was abandoned earlier. That management was abandoned because the DNA, or DNA said no, but they didn't look there. It's all right, so, so they're there. Um, also, Alaska and Washington, Alaska and Washington use this idea of stocklets in managing. Why is it important? It's important because the quota set for the fishing industry to come and take, if that's concentrated in a relatively small area around one or two little islands, um, if those fish are genetically distinct from other fish, it means that you could wipe out that population when in fact you think the Salish Sea has got one big population in Heron that could go anywhere at a spawn, and quite clearly they don't. Um, so that's the stock that has a real impact on the livelihoods of the fishermen and the conservation issues in terms of spawning herring. Sequencing for BC samples is in progress with a colleague called Lawrence Hauser. Eh, we have suggested results, but because this is so controversial in BC, I, can, I cannot say, uh, I'll talk to you about the DNA sequencing at this stage. But we have an alternative technique. What you can do is look at the ear bones of fish which every day lay down a little layer, and it's a fairly stable calcite layer. Um, and uh, they grow through life, and you can actually, using some techniques, you can look at what chemical elements are incorporated in each day's growth of the ear bone. And we've done that now. With a wonderful machine, one of the five best in the world, um, which is sitting there in the geology department in UBC, and geologists use it all the time. So here's the, Otolith microchemistry lab, you can see, point it up, you can see the otoliths on one of the screens, if I can't find the point. Anyway, <laughs> this, one. this is an otolith, that's an earbone. And you can see the, the locations in it, and you can use a little laser to um, uh, 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 vaporize, vaporize one little area of the, of the otolith, and then you can analyze the, the vapor that comes off and see with great precision what's in there, if it's gold, or strontium, or barium, or tellurium, whatever, you know, you can look at all the different elements that are in there if you want. So we've done that, and the suggestion is, from mainly from samples from the central coast, is that you can classify herring um, to their general area, whether it's uh, straight of Georgia or central coast, and that's some results there. Um, let's skip that one. And then, if you look at where they were born by going to the middle of the otolith, the, the middle of the ear bone, where it all started, it's now possible with this preliminary data to distinguish um, stocks from the central coast that are only 10 kilometers apart. So if, even if 25% uh, go to the wrong place, you can still tell for, seven, for three, three ear bones out of four, that they come from somewhere different to 10 kilometers away. And so we think this is now suggested evidence, and we need to do a lot more work to nail it down. Suggested evidence that, uh, in fact, there are stocklets in British Columbia's 
heron, as they are in all other herring, all other herring populations. So that's good. Um, so the answers to my questions um, are: um, Does fishing affect the rest of the system? Yes, but it can be hedged. What impacts could climate change on our herring? There could be serious consequences if we're not taking care of the management at the moment. And do herring go home to spawn? Yes, and that might, uh, that must be considered in the management. And après moi, le déjeuner. But as you know, there is no free lunch, as, as Rachel pointed out. <laughs>